is the relationship between God and logic? Is logic something which is subordinate to God, such that God need not abide by logic? Is God himself bound by logic? Or is logic itself somehow part of the very nature of God? A long tradition within Christianity has thought that this latter option is correct. The idea is that logic is somehow reflective of, or contained within, the very mind of God. This notion goes by the label divine conceptualism, or sometimes theistic conceptual realism. Many theists have thought that this sort of account of logic provides the theist with a ready account of the ontology of logic, and, as a result, they think that the existence of logic can be used as an argument for theism. The most sophisticated attempt at providing such an argument comes from James N. Anderson and Greg Welty in their 2011 paper, The Lord of Non-Contradiction, An Argument for God from Logic. Continuing in the spirit of my videos on why I don't use presuppositional apologetics or the moral argument for theism, this video will explain my own concerns about the argument from logic. Unlike presuppositional apologetics and the moral argument, however, I am actually on board with most of the premises of this argument. As we shall see, I think that the chief flaw emerges in a subtle and unjustified inference from necessary truth to necessary existence. This video will explain the argument and the rationale behind each premise before developing this point as a fundamental objection to the argument from logic. In their paper, James Anderson and Greg Welty never actually formulate their argument into a deductive syllogism. Graham Moore puts the argument into the form of a syllogism as follows. 1. The laws of logic exist. 2. The laws of logic are propositions. They are truths about truths. 3. The laws of logic are necessarily true propositions. They are true in all possible worlds. 4. Hence the laws of logic necessarily exist. They exist in all possible worlds. 5. The laws of logic are non-physical. 6. Since they are propositions, they are intentional entities. 7. Intentional entities are mental. 8. Hence the laws of logic are mental entities, i.e. thoughts. 9. Therefore, necessarily, a mind must exist in order to think them. I think that this is helpful, but Moore's formulation has some drawbacks. It seems to me that his first three premises could all be combined into one, his fifth premise appears unnecessary, and I take it that there are a few more implicit premises which he does not make explicit. I think that we can clarify the syllogism a little more by condensing some of these premises together and by making all of the steps more explicit. I propose the following formulation instead. 1. The laws of logic are necessarily true propositions. 2. Necessarily true propositions exist in all possible worlds. 3. Therefore, the laws of logic exist in all possible worlds. 4. Propositions are non-physical and intentional entities. 5. Non-physical and intentional entities are mental entities or thoughts. Therefore, the laws of logic are mental entities or thoughts. 7. Mental entities or thoughts only exist within minds. 8. Therefore, the laws of logic exist within a mind. 9. Since the laws of logic exist in all possible worlds, the mind in which they exist must also exist in all possible worlds. 10. Therefore, there is a mind which exists in all possible worlds. 11. God is that mind which exists in all possible worlds. 12. Therefore, God exists. Now before I explain which premise I reject and why, let's take a look at Anderson and Welty's supporting justifications for each premise so as to better understand how they are reaching this conclusion. So the first premise states that the laws of logic are necessarily true propositions. This seems uncontroversial enough. The laws of logic can be expressed in sentences, such as the law of identity, every true statement is true and every false statement is false, or the law of non-contradiction, no statement can be both true and false. Propositions are truth bearers. They are the sorts of things which can be expressed by declarative sentences. And since the laws of logic can be expressed as declarative sentences, they must be propositions. As Anderson and Welty explain, philosophers typically use the term propositions to refer to the primary bearers of truth value. So propositions are, by definition, those things that can be true or false. 
and by virtue of which other things can be true or false. So then, given that the laws of logic are truths, we can say that they are propositions in the technical philosophical sense. It is important to recognize that propositions, as the primary bearers of truth value, must be language independent. A proposition isn't a linguistic token like a sentence or statement, although a proposition can be expressed by way of a linguistic token. This point can be seen by observing that one and the same truth or falsehood can be expressed in different languages. We can thus see that a proposition as such can be distinguished from concrete linguistic expressions of that proposition. So one further feature of propositions that we must acknowledge in addition to their role as truth bearers is their language independence. Sentences are language relative in a way that propositions are not. Moreover, logical laws are generally thought to be necessarily true. For example, it seems clear that the proposition that I had a ham sandwich for lunch yesterday is not necessarily true, but rather contingently true. I could have chosen to have a turkey sandwich or a hamburger instead. Conversely, something like a logical contradiction can never be true. Squares could not be circles under any conditions whatsoever. Bachelors could never be married and never be women no matter what. So logical laws are not only true, but they are necessarily true. They cannot be false. As Anderson and Welty say, the laws of logic are not contingent truths. While we can easily imagine the possibility of the Allies losing the war, and thus of the proposition that the Allies won the Second World War being false, we cannot imagine the possibility of the law of non-contradiction being false. That is to say, we cannot imagine any possible circumstances in which a truth could also be a falsehood. Now I should point out that the necessity of the laws of logic is not uncontested these days. There are many philosophers who have advanced alternative logical systems which admit of exceptions to the classical laws of logic or even outright reject them. And it goes beyond the purpose of this video to explore these issues, let alone to defend the necessary truth of the classical laws of logic. Moreover, it is not necessary for me to do so, because, as Anderson and Welty note, this is not really an argument for God from logic at all. Instead, it is an argument for God's existence from the reality of necessary truths. So even if one does not believe that the laws of logic are necessary truths, the basic argument from necessary truths to a necessary mind can be run as long as any necessary truths are granted to obtain. The specific example of the laws of logic is not critical to the overall argument. Perhaps then, it is somewhat misleading to think of this as an argument from logic, and it would be more accurate to think of it as being an argument from necessary truths. Indeed, other philosophers, such as Lorraine Keller, make nearly identical arguments for God from necessary truths more generally. As she explains, the rough idea is this. Truth involves representation. Something is true only if it represents reality as being a certain way, and reality is that way. But representation is a function of minds, so truth is mind-dependent. Yet there are truths that transcend the human mind, such as eternal truths. So there must be a supreme mind with the representational capacity to think these transcendent truths. Therefore, a supreme mind, God, exists. The upshot is that this argument does not really turn on whether or not one accepts the classical laws of logic. Essentially, the same argument can be run so long as any truths are granted to exist. Moving on to the second premise, this premise states that necessarily true propositions exist in all possible worlds. Now, just what is a possible world? Well, very roughly, a possible world is any logically possible state of affairs. So, for example, a unicorn is something which could have existed. The idea of a unicorn is not logically incoherent. So we might say that even though a unicorn does not exist within the actual world, it exists within some possible world. By contrast, something like a square circle or a married bachelor is logically incoherent, and so such things do not exist in any possible worlds. Logically contradictory worlds are, therefore, impossible worlds. As Anderson and Welty explain, our notions of possibility and non-contradiction are bound up with one another. The criterion of logical consistency, 
conformity to the law of non-contradiction is surely the first criterion we apply when determining whether a world is possible or impossible, a world in which some proposition is both true and false, in which some fact both obtains and does not obtain, is by definition an impossible world. But why think that the laws of logic, as necessary truths, would exist in all possible worlds? On certain accounts of what it means for something to be necessary, just is for it to exist within all possible worlds. Alvin Plantinga's modal ontological argument, for example, infers that if God exists in any possible world, then he must exist in every possible world, given that God is a necessary being. So if such an understanding of necessity is to be accepted, then this second premise is trivially true, for to state that a truth is necessary would be the same as saying that it exists in all possible worlds. Again, Anderson and Welty say, If the laws of logic exist, as we have argued, we must ask whether they exist contingently or necessarily. A moment's reflection should make clear that they exist necessarily. We have already seen that the laws of logic are necessary truths. That is, they are true not only in the actual world, but also in every possible world. There is no possible world in which, to use our standard example, the law of non-contradiction is not true. But if the laws of logic are true in every possible world, it follows sensibly enough that they exist in every possible world. So the laws of logic not only exist, but exist necessarily. The third premise, or the first conclusion, should be fairly uncontroversial, since it is a straightforward deductive entailment of the first two premises. From the conjunction of the two propositions that the laws of logic are necessarily true propositions, and that necessarily true propositions exist in all possible worlds, it logically follows that the laws of logic exist in all possible worlds. So I won't spend any time explaining the rationale behind this premise. The fourth premise states that propositions are non-physical and intentional entities. That they are intentional follows rather trivially from the fact that they are truths. After all, to be intentional is just to be about something, and truths are about other things. For example, the proposition that John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963 is a truth about something which happened in the past. The statement refers to something beyond itself. It is intentional. The laws of logic are likewise truths about truths. The law of non-contradiction, for example, states that two contradictory propositions cannot simultaneously be true at the same time and in the same sense. The proposition is thus about other propositions. It is intentional. That the laws of logic are non-physical seems intuitively plausible. As Anderson and Welty say, the laws of logic really exist, and necessarily so. But what kind of things are they? Whatever they are, they cannot be physical or material entities, such as sentences written on paper, or neural configurations in brains. It makes no sense, for instance, to ask where the law of non-contradiction is, because the law of non-contradiction quite evidently lacks any location in space. The question commits an obvious category mistake, nor does it make any sense to ascribe physical properties to the law of non-contradiction, such as mass or velocity or electric charge. It simply isn't that kind of thing. But more fundamentally, the laws of logic must be non-physical by the very nature of the fact that they are necessary truths, since physical objects, by their very nature, are contingent entities. Again, Anderson and Welty explain, in fact, the decisive argument against the physicality of the laws of logic has already been given. Physical entities are, by their very nature, contingent entities. Any physical object we care to consider, whether it exists in fact, like the Empire State Building, or in fiction, like the planet Krypton, is such that its non-existence is possible. Even if that object exists now, it might not have existed. But as we have seen, the laws of logic are not contingent entities. Thus, whatever the laws of logic are, they cannot be physical entities. The fifth premise states that non-physical and intentional entities are thoughts. Now this premise is, of course, not true by definition, as there is a respectable tradition within philosophy known as Platonism. Platonists tend to see propositions as being non-physical and intentional abstract objects, which exist necessarily apart from any minds. 
There is nothing illogical or deficient in this sort of explanation as far as I can see. Nevertheless, Platonism is a quite extravagant and costly metaphysical belief. Surely we shouldn't introduce these other sorts of abstract entities within our ontology without good reasons to do so. Furthermore, even if Platonic entities do exist, it's very difficult to see how we could ever know that they exist, given that they cannot causally interact with the world. As Colin Cheney says, there are reasons for supposing that, if Platonic objects exist, then they lack causal powers and causal properties, or at least the causal power to influence human beings. We usually suppose that, in order to exert a causal influence, an object must do so at some particular time and place, and this would not be possible for an object lacking a spatio-temporal location. If we believe that human beings are completely located within space and time, then it seems that we must be totally isolated from objects that exist outside space and time. Platonists claim that we can know of the existence of Platonic objects and discover various of their properties. But there is a long-standing epistemological objection to such claims. The argument is as follows. We can only know about something if we causally interact with it. But we cannot causally interact with Platonic objects. Therefore, even if they exist, we cannot know about Platonic objects. Now I do think that Cheney goes too far here, since I wouldn't want to go as far as to say that we can only know that something exists if we can causally interact with it. Nevertheless, the Platonist is going to owe us some sort of an explanation for how knowledge of a-causal objects is possible, since it is not immediately obvious that such knowledge would be attainable. So if we are to be able to explain the existence of non-physical and intentional entities from things which we already know to exist, then we should staunchly resist any move towards Platonism. And as it happens, I think that we do have an easy alternative candidate which we already know to exist, namely thoughts. That thoughts can be propositional and intentional is not controversial. I see no obvious reason why anyone who already admits of these propositional entities known as thoughts within their ontology should add on this further ontological category known as propositions. Moreover, our own mental concepts, which are the constituents of propositions, can do most of the explanatory work which Platonists posit abstract objects and universals to explain. As Chris Swoyer explains, conceptualism, along with nominalism and realism, is one of three traditional families of views about universals. There are many species of each family, but the basic storyline goes like this. Realists hold that there are universal properties and that these solve the problems of universals. Conceptualists deny this, arguing that concepts can do most of the work realists invoke properties to do. The basic trick is to put enough in the head that concepts can play their causal, psychological roles while having them anchored tightly enough to the world outside our heads that they can be stable over time and among people. The advantage of conceptualism is that it does this work using exclusively entities which we independently know to exist, since they exist within our own minds. Consequently, conceptualism emerges as being a more parsimonious alternative to Platonism. As Welty argues, we are committed to not multiplying ontological kinds beyond necessity. Therefore, if propositions and possible worlds can be satisfactorily understood as belonging to an ontological kind we already accept, this in itself is an argument that we should so understand them. Thoughts as mental entities have an intentional character. They variously claim, assert, attribute, predicate, and represent. Thus they are natural candidates to do the philosophical work of propositions. There seems to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between thoughts and propositions with respect not only to directedness, but also to aspectual shape. A conceptualist might therefore contend that we not only can, but should understand propositions as thoughts of some sort, for the intentionality of propositions is best explained as the intentionality of thoughts. If we are already committed, as most of us are, to persons as items in our ontology, then being committed to conceptualism about propositions enables us to be realists about these things, 
while respecting the principle of ontological kind economy. Simply put, realists about propositions should be conceptualists about propositions. That thoughts are non-physical is considerably more contentious. It is not the purpose of this video to defend an immaterialist theory of mind, although I think that such a defense can be made. So I will have to content myself with saying that if both thoughts and the laws of logic are agreed upon to be intentional, and if the aforementioned reasons for thinking that the laws of logic are non-physical hold, then for the sake of having a simpler ontology, I propose that it is more prudent to consider the idea that the laws of logic are just thoughts, and that, consequently, thoughts are non-physical. It seems to me much more ontologically economical to suppose that the thoughts which we already know to exist are non-physical in order to explain the existence of non-physical laws of logic than to suppose that this entirely otherworldly realm of platonic abstract objects exists. Moreover, we already have epistemic access to our own thoughts via direct acquaintance, whereas it is at the very least unclear how we could ever have epistemic access to these a-causal abstract objects. I will have to let mind-body physicalists make of this what they will, since, as I said, this is not the place to offer a full-scale defense of substance dualism or of an immaterialist theory of mind more generally. Anderson and Welty agree with all of this, saying, there is good reason to regard intentionality as the distinctive mark of the mental. Mental items, what we might generally term thoughts, are distinguished from non-mental items by their exhibiting intentionality. There is certainly a sense in which physical marks on a page, such as this one, can exhibit intentionality. But it's equally evident that this intentionality is derivative. It is dependent on the prior activity of a mind. The physical marks exhibit intentionality only insofar as they express thoughts. Without minds conferring meaning upon them, no physical structures would ever be about anything else, for only a mind has the intrinsic power to direct thoughts. In a universe without minds and thoughts, no physical structures could be ascribed truth values. It is the mental, and only the mental, that exhibits intentionality intrinsically. It is the mental that confers intentionality on the non-mental. Thoughts, then, are the paradigmatic category of intentional entities, and the existence of thoughts is uncontroversial. The question then arises as to how propositions relate to thoughts, given that propositions also exist and exhibit intentionality. Where should propositions be located in our ontology? Are propositions simply thoughts of some kind? Are they essentially mental items? Or should we posit a separate ontological category for propositions as intentional but non-mental items? Surely the first option is the simplest and least arbitrary of the two. Unless we have some good independent reason for insisting that propositions are not mental items, we should conclude, on the basis that they possess the distinctive marks of the mental, that propositions are indeed mental items, rather than positing a sui generis ontological category for them to occupy. One might go so far as to say that the principle of parsimony demands it. Propositions, then, are best construed as mental in nature, and since the laws of logic are propositions, we should construe them as mental in nature too. So while the fifth premise is not true by definition, that necessary truths like the laws of logic are thoughts, does seem to be the best explanation of what they ontologically are. Interestingly enough, Anderson and Welty regard this as the most controversial step in their argument, but I am quite in agreement with them on this central idea that propositions like the laws of logic are thoughts. Where I diverge from them, as we shall see, is that these must be construed as divine thoughts. The sixth premise, as with the third, is really just a conclusion from the previous two premises, and it deductively follows from them. That is to say, from the conjunction of the premises that propositions are non-physical intentional entities, and that non-physical intentional entities are mental entities or thoughts, it follows that the laws of logic must be mental entities or thoughts. The seventh premise asserts that mental entities or thoughts only exist within minds. This premise is true by definition, and the eighth premise, concluding that the laws of logic exist within a mind, follows deductively from the 6th and 7th premises. Premises 9, 10, 11, and the conclusion, 
are all straightforward deductive inferences from the prior premises, which together entail the existence of a necessary mind which can be called God, as Anderson and Welty argue, but now an obvious question arises. Just whose thoughts are the laws of logic? There are no more thoughts without minds than there is smoke without fire. Our first inclination might be to say that they must be our thoughts. But the laws of logic couldn't be our thoughts, or the thoughts of any other contingent being for that matter, for as we've seen, the laws of logic exist necessarily if they exist at all. For any human person S, S might not have existed along with S's thoughts. The law of non-contradiction, on the other hand, could not have failed to exist, otherwise it could have failed to be true. If the laws of logic are necessarily existent thoughts, then they can only be the thoughts of a necessarily existent mind. It doesn't require much further thought to see whose mind this must be. A necessarily existent mind must be the mind of a necessarily existent person, and this, as Aquinas would say, everyone understands to be God. Okay, so now that we have a reasonably good understanding of the argument and the reasoning behind each of the premises, I may now proceed to explain why I think that this argument does not succeed. My concern regards both the first and the second premises of this argument. I think that the second premise is false, and this may also mean that the first premise is false, depending upon how certain terms are being defined. It will be helpful for me to begin by explaining my own account of what the laws of logic actually are, as this will make it clear why I don't accept the second premise. Like Anderson and Welty, and as I have already expressed, I think that logical laws are just thoughts but I do not see the need to think of them as being uniquely divine thoughts as opposed to merely human thoughts. Of course, as a theist myself, I believe that God is omniscient and so knows all true propositions, including the laws of logic, but that is because I have additional reasons for believing that God exists. That God also has these thoughts is not doing any work in explaining why these thoughts exist, since I take it that even if God did not exist, the law of non-contradiction would still exist within my own mind as one of my own thoughts. Now perhaps there is a concern here regarding how it is that the law of non-contradiction can be one of my thoughts. After all, surely other people also know the law of non-contradiction, but there is only one law of non-contradiction, and presumably everyone is not somehow tapping into my mind. So perhaps one might think that we need some sort of omnipresent divine mind from which all of us access the law of non-contradiction. In fact, Anderson and Welty express such sentiments, saying, One problem with this suggestion is that thoughts belong essentially to the minds that produce them. Your thoughts necessarily belong to you. We could not have had your thoughts, except in the weaker sense, that we could have had thoughts with the same content as yours, which presupposes a distinction between human thoughts and the content of those thoughts, propositions. I'm actually going to bite the bullet on this one and just admit that, strictly speaking, I do not believe that there is one single law of non-contradiction. Since I take the law of non-contradiction to be a human thought, and since humans do not literally share the same thoughts, but rather each possess their own thoughts, this commits me to the idea that there are as many laws of non-contradiction as there are people who possess that thought. But speaking in this way is misleading, because when one says that there are many laws of non-contradiction, it is easy for this statement to give off the impression that these laws differ from one another with respect to their propositional content. However, that is not what I am saying at all. I staunchly maintain that any given law of non-contradiction within any individual mind is indistinguishable from that contained within any other mind. They all correspond exactly to one another, and it is in virtue of this exact correspondence among the thoughts that we can casually speak of the law of non-contradiction as though it were one single thing. As for Anderson and Welty's objection that this notion of shared content between different thoughts presupposes a distinction between thoughts and content, that may be true if taken literally. But if we instead understand this in terms of distinct thoughts corresponding to one another, this removes any idea of content as something distinct from thought itself. Nor do I think that this implies some sort of subjectivism or relativism about truth, because although the law of non-contradiction as a thought 
does depend upon the existence of a contingent mind, the correspondence relation, in virtue of which the law of non-contradiction is true, is stance independent. That is to say, no one's opinion makes this thought known as the law of non-contradiction true. The thought would still be true even if the one who has the thought believed it to be false. So there are no drastically skeptical or relativistic implications which emerge from saying that the laws of logic are just human thoughts, plain and simple. As a final point, it's not clear that Anderson and Welty's position really allows them to maintain that the same thoughts cannot be shared among different individuals since, given their divine conceptualism, they think that anyone's belief in the laws of logic is somehow an instance of them sharing God's thought. As Alex Malpass points out, if God has a thought which has the law of non-contradiction as its content, then the law of non-contradiction is not to be associated with God's thought any more than it is if I have a thought with the law of non-contradiction as its content. The significance of God in the equation has been completely removed. It seems that the central claim of a divine conceptualist has been undermined if we take this route. When the divine conceptualist says that laws of logic are divine thoughts, we take it that the claim is saying that they are thoughts that are at least somewhat similar to human thoughts. This seems to be required for the argument from propositions being intentional. This last claim is undermined significantly if the extension of mental includes things which are significantly unlike human thoughts. I think where I worry that the problem with taking that route, it seems to me, is it's I think it creates a tension with the earlier part of your argument, right? Because aren't we supposed to be starting off tickling our intuitions with the idea that, well, you know, well, why think that propositions are thoughts at all? Well, it's because they're intentional. Um, and now we find at the end of the journey, we're offered an account of divine thoughts that are really not intentional because they don't have any content. So uh, why should I think these are even thoughts? I mean, at all of this point, you know, you were saying previously, well, there's this uh, bargain on the table. Right? We've already, we already know that thoughts have the power to be about things and have aspectual shape and stuff. But when we come to look at the, the thoughts that you're presenting to us, they're not like that at all. They're in fact completely different. They're basically just propositions. I mean, the fact that you want to call them part of God, I mean, that's fine. But like, they're as far away from thoughts are, you know, my humdrum normal human thoughts as propositions are. I mean, they're just, they're basically inert um, contents of thoughts. Right, it, this, the, you've made them play the role of proposition so much that they now don't look like thoughts anymore, at least normal thoughts. So all that bit in the argument that led up to it, where we're supposed to be thinking, oh, there is some similarity between propositions and thoughts. Maybe propositions just are thoughts. And it seems to me that's undermined by the, this conclusion. If you take the, if you avoid my dilemma by just saying, oh, well, God's thoughts don't have any content, then I guess that seems to me there's there's still a tension there. It's difficult to resolve that. So while I am in agreement with Anderson and Welty that one cannot share the thoughts of another individual, I think that my non-divine conceptualist model affords me a way around this. Conversely, it's unclear that their divine conceptualism does so in a way which does not undercut any possible motivation which one might have for adopting it in the first place. A related point is that even if Anderson and Welty can find a way around this problem of the inability of beings to literally share each other's thoughts, they will still incur many of the same epistemological challenges faced by the Platonist. Specifically, it becomes unclear how we are able to gain access to God's own thoughts. Remember, for divine conceptualists, God's thoughts are essentially just replacements for Platonic abstract objects. They function in much the same way and are similarly removed from the world in which we live. As the divine conceptualist James McLaughlin explains, Welty is attempting to build a picture of abstract objects as identical with divine ideas, such that these ideas function as abstract objects have traditionally thought to function in most Platonist theories. According to Welty, since the divine aseity of God's knowledge of all possibilities, of everything he can bring about and has brought about, is completely independent of creatures, then a whole range of God's thoughts can be seen to function as abstract objects in relation to the created realm. 
Welty thus goes on to specifically argue for a model of abstract objects as divine thoughts or divine ideas. But presumably God's thoughts are not generally transparently available to us in the way that our own thoughts are. So how is it that we are able to access the mind of God in the way that Anderson and Welty's theistic conceptualism requires that we do? And why do we only have this sort of access to some of God's thoughts and not to others? And even if some plausible story can be told as to how this might happen, it seems that this story will further blow our ontology by introducing some mysterious mechanism by which our minds can have this sort of access to God's mind. So the non-divine conceptualist, who holds that laws of logic are nothing more than our own thoughts, retains a parsimony advantage over the divine conceptualist inasmuch as it relies on nothing more than our own familiar acquaintance with our own thoughts to explain how it is that we have epistemic access to these laws. So having briefly explained what I think that propositions like the laws of logic are, hopefully viewers can begin to see why I am skeptical that they exist in every possible world. And this, in turn, should make it clear why I don't accept the second premise of the argument. I take it that there is a sense in which a proposition can be necessarily true without thereby necessarily existing. As Graham Moore puts it, let us grant the premise that propositions are mind-dependent entities. Let's also accept that there are some propositions that are necessarily true, because of course there are. Does it follow that necessarily a mind must exist for these propositions to depend on? No, but why not? Because a proposition can be necessarily true without necessarily existing. Of course, things get a bit tricky here, because Anderson and Welty don't explain precisely what they mean by a possible world, beyond saying, here we take possible world in the conventional sense, a way the world could have been, or a possible state of affairs. But this explanation leaves open a wide range of understandings of possible worlds. Necessary truths, like the laws of logic, might exist in all possible worlds, under a propositionalist account of possible worlds, where possible worlds are just defined in terms of logically consistent sets of propositions. But if we take a possible world to merely be any state of affairs which neither involves nor entails a contradiction, then it's not at all clear that necessary truths will exist in all possible worlds. Philosophers widely accept that a state of affairs is possible as long as it is conceivable. As Stephen Yablo explains, of the possible propositions, how do we tell that they are possible? Hume's famous answer is that it is an established maxim in metaphysics that whatever the mind clearly conceives includes the idea of possible existence, or in other words, that nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. And if there is a serious alternative basis for possibility theses, philosophers have not discovered it. Anderson and Welty seem to agree with this basic method of determining possibility, saying, Here we rely on the widely shared intuition that conceivability is a reliable guide to possibility. So if we accept that conceivability is a guide to possibility, then it seems clear that we can conceive of a state of affairs where no minds and no propositions whatsoever exist. Imagine a world which consists of nothing besides an endless ocean with smooth green stones in it. This seems to be a conceivable state of affairs. Moreover, in this scenario, there are no minds, no thoughts, no abstract objects, no propositional entities of any kind. In short, there are no truths. If such a world is possible, as it surely seems to be, then we cannot say that there are any truths which exist in all possible worlds. This may also entail that the first premise of the argument is false. For if there are possible worlds in which no truths at all exist, then there are no truths which exist on all possible worlds. And if one thinks of necessary truths as being, by definition, truths which exist in all possible world, then there are no necessary truths. Now I agree with this general line of reasoning as far as it goes. Since I think that I can conceive of possible worlds in which exclusively physical objects and in which no truths of any kind whatsoever exist, I do not think that there are any truths which exist in all possible worlds. So, to the extent that the first premise is just defining necessary truths as truths which exist in all possible worlds, I am not going to accept that premise is true.
if the first premise is not defining necessary truths in terms of existing in all possible worlds, then the second premise does not follow. Now I can see Anderson or Welty or some other defender of this argument pouncing upon this last statement and triumphantly saying, see, you have to deny the necessary truth of logic in order to get out of this argument. But I don't really think that this is quite true either. I am rejecting that the laws of logic are necessarily true in this very specific sense of existing in all possible worlds. But it remains open to me to say that the laws of logic are necessarily true in some other sense. For example, I might think that the laws of logic are necessarily true in a conditional or hypothetical sense. That is to say, I might take the position that the laws of logic would always be true if they existed to be true. This would be so even for worlds in which there are no laws of logic. Although he does not himself accept this account, Joshua Rasmussen explains it thusly. Perhaps we can interpret P is necessarily true as P is essentially true. If we do, then when we say that a proposition is necessarily true, we are equivalently saying that that proposition is true if and only if it exists. A contingent proposition, by contrast, would be true in some but not all possible worlds at which it exists. If that is how things are, then perhaps a proposition can be necessarily true even if it does not necessarily exist, in which case the argument for necessarily existing propositions is unsound. Consider again the world where nothing exists but an endless ocean of smooth green stones. If the law of non-contradiction were to exist within that world, then it would be true, even though, by hypothesis, the law of non-contradiction does not exist to be true in that world. So it's not clear that one has to adopt the understanding of necessary truths as truths which actually exist in every possible world. Anderson and Welty anticipate this move in a footnote. They have this to say in response. Another potential objection must be addressed here. Why must we say that the law of non-contradiction could not have failed to be true? Couldn't we make the weaker necessity claim that it could not have both existed and failed to be true, equivalently that it could not have been false? The problem with this proposal, as Plantinga points out, is that on this weaker account of logical necessity, too many propositions turn out to be necessary. When we consult the relevant citation from Plantinga, we find ourselves faced with the following objection to the idea that propositions might be concrete mental entities as I have proposed. Perhaps the conceptualist might suggest that we are asking too much when we ask that a necessary proposition be strongly necessary, that is, such that it could not have failed to be true. She may want instead to maintain that for a proposition to be necessarily true is for it to have the property of being true essentially, but that, she adds, does not require that the proposition in question be such that it can't fail to be true. What it requires is that it can't both exist and fail to be true. For a proposition P to be necessary, it is not required that P be such that it could not have failed to be true. All that's required is weak necessity, that P be such that it could not have been false. But this suggestion has its own problems. Suppose the concretist thinks propositions are brain inscriptions. Then the proposition, there are brain inscriptions, obviously enough, will be such that it could not have been false. It is therefore necessary that there are brain inscriptions, and hence necessary that there are brains. On this account, far too many propositions turn out to be necessary, and given that necessity and possibility are related as duals, we expect, of course, that the same difficulties will arise for possibility. The concretist can't say that a proposition is possible just in case it couldn't have been true, the duel of weak necessity. For then, far too few propositions are possible. It is possible, for example, that there be no human beings and no brain inscriptions. But on the concretist view, of course, this proposition could not have been true. The conclusion, I think, is that propositions can't be concrete, contingently existing objects such as human mental acts. So as I understand Plantinga, he offers two arguments against the thesis that propositions can be human thoughts in the way that I have suggested. First, he objects that it leads to too many propositions being necessarily true. Second, 
he objects that it leads to too few propositions being possible. Now it seems to me that Plantinga, and by extension Anderson and Welty, are confusing the conceptualist position for an account of what propositions must be as opposed to an account of what propositions in fact are. Hitherto, I have argued that thoughts provide the best explanation for what propositions actually are, but I would readily concede that other accounts of propositions are logically possible and conceivable, meaning that I can say that propositions conceived of in this way exist in some possible worlds and bear truth values in those possible worlds. This point will become important as I turn to answer planting as objections. With respect to the first of these objections, Plantinga argues that if propositions are construed as brain inscriptions, then the proposition that there are brain inscriptions will be necessarily true, even though it is obviously not necessarily true that brain inscriptions exist. Now I have argued that propositions are immaterial thoughts which, per substance dualism, can exist wholly apart from the brain. But Plantinga can rather easily modify his objection to meet my substance dualist version of conceptualism. Instead of saying that the proposition, there are brain inscriptions, turns out to be necessarily true, the proposition that thoughts exist turns out to be necessarily true. But this only follows if one thinks that propositions must be thoughts, but that is not my position. I take it that, in the actual world, propositions just are thoughts. However, I can conceive of another possible world in which there are no thoughts, and yet there are platonic abstract objects. Let us suppose that, in this hypothetical world, one of these abstract objects is the proposition that thoughts exist. In this world, the proposition that thoughts exist both exists and is false. Therefore, it is not a necessary truth, even in the weak sense. So adopting the idea that propositions are, in the actual world, thoughts, does not yield the conclusion that thoughts exist is a necessarily true proposition, even in the weak sense. Perhaps Plantinga could extend out other examples, which he thinks indicate that conceptualism entails the existence of too many necessary truths. But in fact, this is the only example he offers, and I have argued that it does not succeed. Regarding Plantinga's second objection, once again, we see that Plantinga is confusing the conceptualist position for an account of what propositions must be. He argues that the conceptualist is committed to the idea that it is not possible that there be no human beings and no brain inscriptions, or in my case, no minds and no thoughts. However, contra Plantinga, the conceptualist is not by any means committed to saying that the proposition that no minds exist is not possibly true. For once again, we may conceive of a possible world where there are no minds, and yet there are abstract objects in the Platonic sense, one of which is the proposition that no minds exist. In this case, the proposition that no minds exist is possibly true, in the sense that there is a possible world in which that proposition corresponds to the way things are, and yet, in the actual world, propositions depend upon contingent minds. Now if all of this seems a bit too complex, we could alternatively think of necessary truths as being about all possible worlds, as opposed to being within all possible worlds. To illustrate, return yet again to the world containing nothing but an endless ocean of smooth green rocks. Within our actual world, I can describe that possible world via true propositions, such as the proposition that smooth green stones exist in that world. But those truths need not exist within that possible world, since, by hypothesis, no truths at all exist within that world. Instead, the truths which describe that world exist within this world, and are only about that world. So long as propositions can refer to worlds outside of and beyond the worlds in which they exist, there should be no real problem with saying that necessary truths can be true of or about all possible worlds, from within our world, as opposed to being true in all possible worlds. Again, Moore explains, Notice that on this account of necessary truth, a proposition need not itself exist inside a world, as one of its denizens, in order for it to be true at, or with respect to that world. In order for a proposition to be true at a world, 
all it needs to do is represent things in such a way that obtains in that world. It need not itself exist in that world. In short, truth at a world does not imply residing in that world. If I'm right about this, then it follows that a proposition can be necessarily true without also being a necessarily existing entity. This video has reviewed an argument for God's existence from the laws of logic as formulated by James Anderson and Greg Welty. I have tried my best to clearly and succinctly lay out the argument and their defenses of its premises. I have pointed out that I share substantial areas of agreement with Anderson and Welty. In particular, I agree with what is arguably the most controversial premise in the argument, namely that the laws of logic are thoughts. However, I have also endeavored to explain where I think that the argument goes wrong. Specifically, I do not accept the inference from the laws of logic being true necessarily to them existing necessarily in the sense of existing in all possible worlds. I have done my best to motivate the idea that there are some possible worlds in which no propositions at all exist, and so there are no necessarily existing truths. I have proposed a non-divine version of conceptualism which, I think, has all of the advantages that Anderson and Welty claim for their divine conceptualism and none of the drawbacks. Furthermore, I have attempted to answer the objections which Anderson and Welty raise against my non-divine conceptualism. I hope that, if nothing else, this makes clear why it is that I do not use the argument from logic when making my own case for theism.